we may be about to experience a great Cardano migration, unlike anything the crypto space has seen before. And this might fundamentally change how we have to intellectually approach the Cardano ecosystem. Ready? Let's go. As we inch closer and closer to the Alonzo Hard Fork Combinator event, Cardano is poised to become the only decentralized smart contract blockchain with a protocol that's not broken by absurd fees. Predictably, this is going to be very attractive to a wide spectrum of new actors in our ecosystem, and they're likely to be of a different character than the types of actors we've experienced previously. This is going to require a new mindset as you look at our Cardano ecosystem. Dunbar's number is an idea that's been around since the 1990s, but it's enjoyed more popularity lately due to the efforts of certain podcasters. And it's basically this idea that humans and other primates evolved to be able to deal with a certain number of actors in their societal ecosystems. Uh, there's a certain number of stable relationships that a primate can can maintain. And in the case of humans, this proposed number is 150. And while, while there have been efforts to debunk this number, and while some would argue there's not sufficient evidence to establish any such threshold, it does seem like it's fairly obvious that humans can only hold enough data in their head to understand the social interactions of a certain number of members in a group. And it seems like we're getting to that tipping point now in Cardano, where we might be about to see the beginning of a huge influx of different actors in our ecosystem that'll all be interacting with each other. And we won't any longer be able to keep enough data in our heads to keep track of how all these disparate members of the group are interacting with each other and you know, have any kind of like perspective on the value of each of those members within the group without referencing something. That's some kind of fuzzy language about a sort of hazy idea about human psychology. But we have a concrete example from just the last couple of days of what happens when you don't quite have enough data about all the various actors that are interacting with your ecosystem. Here we have a tweet. This tweet, uh, if we just read the username, Gary Gensler, we all know, hey, this is Gary Gensler, the head of the SEC, who used to teach a whole bunch of blockchain and crypto classes at MIT. So this is a pretty, um, pretty big authority figure who can have a huge impact on the whole crypto space. And we see this tweet, it says, we know what happened last time. The time has come to accept change and bring regulation clarity for orderly markets, a busy few weeks ahead. This, uh, this, this was kind of a, when I read this tweet, immediately there was a red flag for me in the grammar. Uh, he said, the time has come to accept change and bring regulation clarity. For me, I don't picture anybody from the SEC ever using the phrase regulation clarity. I would see them using the phrase regulatory clarity. So I was a little bit, I was a little bit taken aback by that. I was a little bit like, hey, uh, this doesn't seem like something Gary Gensler would say. And I look down below at the photo and the photo has to do with these headlines, Santander blocks payments to Binance for UK account holders. And we saw over the last few days, uh, even a very popular Twitter account within the Cardano space was complaining about uh, their, uh, their account being blocked from uh, sending payments to, to Binance. So this was, this was uh, very familiar. Then you go over to the right and you look at what they're comparing this to. They're comparing this to an article from back in the day entitled Telephone Industry Moves to Ban Internet Phone Software. And multiple different actors within the Cardo Cardano ecosystem and the larger crypto ecosystem liked this particular post. You read this and you think to yourself, this is so interesting. Gary Gensler is posting this and he's basically, this is like the head of the US SEC commenting on a non-US bank and what they're doing in the UK and comparing this to the phone industry trying to resist the internet back in the day. This is so weird. 
a lot of people though, from the Cardano ecosystem saw this and liked it. And you know, it could be that they realized what I'm about to show you, but I, I hate to say, I think they probably did not realize what I'm about to show you. So this account, Gary Gensler, SEC commentary, if you go to the top of the account, you look, it says Gary Gensler, SEC commentary, views are my own at Gary Gensler. Um, you know, he's got like kind of a, an SEC logo up there, but this doesn't look very, <laughs> this doesn't look very official. And then you read the byline fixing chairs in the U S securities and exchange commission. You're like, wow, Gary Gensler has a really good sense of humor. But then you read genuine Pascanod for my twin brother. What does that mean? So you might Google this word. Pascanade. It's telling me it's pronounced with a with a hard A there. Pascanade, and the definition is a satire or lampoon, originally one displayed or delivered publicly in a public place. Wait a second. I come back here and look at this account. I realize this isn't Gary Gensler, G E N S L E R. This is Gary Gensler, G E N S capital. I E R Gary Gensier. This is the account of Gary Gensier. And that little letter right there is not an L that is a capital I. And even it can even look like Gary Gensler in the, um, in the address bar, but it's a, it's a capital I, this is not the real Gary Gensler. And I'm sure all the Cardano ecosystem participants who liked that, that tweet would probably claim after the fact that they knew all along this was a satire account and they liked the tweet for humorous purposes, but I can guarantee you probably, you know, a very, very large number of the 503 people who liked this tweet thought this was actually Gary Gensler. And the reason they thought it was actually Gary Gensler was because the number of people in crypto far exceeds whatever you think the actual Dunbar number is. So they didn't have any background about Gary Gensler to know whether or not he would be making jokes like this about fixing chairs in the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Would he be using such a ridiculous low-res graphic of uh, a candle chart in the, in the, I guess it was already candles, but some kind of a, some kind of a market chart with a bunch of moving averages behind the SEC label? Would he refer to it as regulation clarity as opposed to regulatory clarity? They didn't have enough data about this actor in the ecosystem. We'll call him an actor in the ecosystem, the head of the SEC. They didn't have enough data about how that person would talk and what an actual Twitter account of theirs would look like to know that this was Gary Gensier, not Gary Gensler. You might think, hey, this kind of social media impersonation happens all the time, but it's actually a material difference in your understanding of what's going on in the crypto space, if you think that the head of the SEC is spending that much time tweeting all day about cryptos and like hashtagging SafeMoon, and that he's criticizing Santander for not allowing their customers to interact with Binance, that's a material difference in your understanding of what the SEC is up to. And th there was at least one very well-known Cardano project that liked that tweet. So, and again, of course, after the fact, they will, of course, claim that they knew it was satire all along, but who knows, right? So we are already, you can tell from this, uh, from this infographic, we are already on our way to being past that Dunbar number. So these are largely DeFi or DeFi related projects. There's a few wallets in there, you know, they're talking about, they uh, include graphics for your Roy and Daedalus and a few other types of things like that. But largely this is just DeFi and there are 67 different projects in here. We're still months away from the Alonzo Hard Fork Combinator event. We're gonna have a lot more projects on infographics like this before we actually get to Alonzo. And then once we actually do get to Alonzo and we have smart contracts on mainnet, then we could really see something new because while Cardano has a market cap of about 32.7 billion right now, the total value locked in DeFi projects right now on other chains, according to DeFi Llama here is almost 115 billion. And you can see the breakdown here. I mean, 
just in one project curve, we've got $9.69 billion locked up. And a lot of these projects, you know, some of them are on Binance, some of them are multi-chain, but a lot of these projects are just on Ethereum. With the Ethereum projects, you know, they're not loving their customers having to pay those extraordinary fees. It doesn't make sense for their customers to do certain things or do things below a certain value threshold if the fees uh, from the transactions are going to eat up whatever, whatever value they might have gained from that transaction. With Binance, we have a different story. It's a centralized blockchain. And while that allows them to keep the fees low, part of the ethos of crypto is decentralization. And Binance is fundamentally sort of violating that principle that pulled a lot of us into crypto in the first place. Here's another infographic that shows us how much each ecosystem owns of that total value locked number in all of DeFi. And you can see the two biggest chunks are Ethereum and uh, Binance. And uh, you know, while one has sort of philosophical problems, the other has practical problems related to fees, among other things, um, you can imagine this is a lot, this is a lot of the DeFi space that would probably love to remedy certain things about their the blockchains they're currently they're currently residing on, and you know it's um it's a pretty good guess that you know Cardano is possibly going to solve all those problems. So we might see. I mean, we're going to see some number of projects from both of these spaces, but a lot of these spaces uh, coming over to Cardano. Why wouldn't they? They're in the business of making money. And uh, to make that money, they want to be on the most optimal blockchain possible. And it may turn out as soon as we have smart contracts on Cardano, it may turn out that Cardano is that most op optimal place to be running their businesses. If that happens, we could see an onslaught of new actors in our ecosystem. And they could be coming from anywhere in this list, from any other chain or project. I mean, there's only so many decentralized blockchains in the top five. And... Cardano, you can make a pretty good argument that Cardano, as soon as we have smart contracts, we're going to be the only one with a uh, with a protocol that actually actually works the way people want it to work. So we could be seeing any number of these kind of projects migrating over there once they realize what Cardano post Alonzo Hardfork Combinator event really, really presents. And the hard part for us, we're already inside Cardano, inside the Cardano ecosystem is that we kind of have to change our thinking. So far, our ecosystem has been full of these homegrown projects, like people who've been with, with us since the start. And as soon as we have this sort of avalanche of new projects, if that's what, what ends up happening, we're gonna have a number of actors and projects that far, far exceed whatever the actual Dunbar number really is, whether it's 150 or something else. We're going to have way more people, way more actors, way more individuals, projects involved and all that. And we're not going to be able to keep track of who's who. And to make matters even worse, they're all probably going to say there's enough money on the line. They're all probably going to say the right things. If they decide that, you know, Cardano, the Cardano ecosystem is really really centered on decentralization they're going to say all the right things about decentralization they're going to spin you know spin their projects to make them seem consistent with decentralization they're all going to wear the mantle of they're all going to don the mantle of cardano the cardano ethos they're all going to say the right things they're all going to say we've just been waiting for for a blockchain like cardano to come along now it's finally here. We've been all about Cardano since the start. And that's not necessarily going to be true of a lot of them, but they're all going to say the right thing. So it's going to be very hard to tell, tell apart the actors in the ecosystem that care about the same things as us early adopters from the new actors in the ecosystem that don't give a damn. They're just in it to make the money. And there's nothing wrong with economic self-interest. I think that's a, an important ingredient in free market economies. Uh, and probably most importantly, the reason why we shouldn't be extremely, extremely worried about this, this, uh, this flood of, of new projects inside Cardano is that 
Cardano was built, I believe Cardano was built from the beginning with this in mind. They weren't thinking, hey, we're going to have one, one, uh, one DEX. We're going to have one, um, one lending DAP. We're going to have one synthetic asset DAP. We're going to have, you know, uh, one NFT project. I think they were building, I think they were building Cardano all along to eventually accommodate this many different actors in the ecosystem. You know, some with good intentions, some with good effects. Maybe we should talk about effects as opposed to intentions because maybe at the end of the day, intentions don't uh, matter as much as effects do. But some that'll have good effects on the ecosystem, some that might have bad effects on the ecosystem. But I believe Cardano was built from the start to include incentives that will shape the behavior of all these different types of actors. And there will be new classes of users new classes of users of the Cardano ecosystem who will be patronizing these projects too. Um, you know, I mean, they're kind of, you know, a, a certain stereotype is sort of derisively labeled DeFi DGENs. I have friends, uh, I have friends who in years past have, you know, like, um, put themselves into that category, you know, when they found themselves staying up all night, looking at different liquidity pools and trying to eke out, you know, a certain amount of profit and, you know, definitely they put themselves in the same category. So I'm not saying those are bad people, but I'm saying their interest in the Cardano ecosystem, even as users might be very different than us early adopters. And DeFi isn't going to be the only place we see this. It's also very possible that lists like this of the available stake pools in the Cardano ecosystem, even though they seem very expansive to us right now, I, I don't I don't know what the current count is. Last time I looked, it was like over 2,600, but it's very possible that lists like this could change pretty radically as well over the next time period. It's I don't think it's any secret to anybody that people are starting to take note of the amount of money that can be made from Cardano stake pools if you're able to saturate them. And the group of people who seem to have taken the most note of this are people with large social media followings. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if we start seeing, um, let's call them media personalities, jumping into the ADA stake pool game, claiming that they were all about Cardano all along. And, you know, it's going to be very possible that a lot of those people won't know a damn thing about Cardano. They'll have just figured out that if they have a certain number of followers on social media, they can probably, you know, and they're calculating what percentage of those might hold ADA or be willing to hold ADA. And they'll probably figure out that they could saturate a couple stake pools, maybe a whole bunch of stake pools. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see an influx of these types of people. I'm not saying we're going to have anything as cataclysmic as a Kim Kardashian stake pool. But I'm saying we're probably going to see some amount of that. Um, I think a lot of uh, crypto personalities who previously have maybe had a little bit to do with Cardano, like they were talking about Cardano a little bit, but they were really Bitcoin, Ethereum type people. I think already we're seeing them realize how much money they can make with Cardano stake pools. And if they have a certain number of followers, they know a certain percentage are going to be Cardano holders and they're going to be able to saturate a pool. We're going to see all of those types of characters opening up starting stake pools. And the Cardano community, especially the community of stake pool operators, are not going to love this. They're not going to be happy about this at all. But again, I think this is the kind of thing that was always inevitable. I think Cardano was built knowing that these things would end up happening. And the right incentives have been built in. Even if somebody comes in and they open up, a, you know, open up 12 stake pools and they totally don't care about Cardano decentralization or they're, you know, somehow they're doing other things that all of us early adopters, you know, might not totally agree with. Um, even if they do that, I think the right incentives have been built into the Cardano ecosystem to shape the behavior of all those types of new actors. And I think we'll even be able to do stuff in the future. We'll be able to figure out ways to maintain the decentralization of the, you know, Cardano stake pool community. Even if we have, you know, even if PewDiePie were to come in and say he's going to open up 175 stake pools or something, and every, every 11 year old 
who watches his channel, you know, decides to buy Ada and stake to his pools. I think we'll still be able to figure out a way to, you know, change the parameters, uh, change K, change A naught. You know, we'll figure out ways to change the parameter, the stake pool parameters to to accommodate those kinds of evolutions as well. So I don't think we need to freak out about what could be an onslaught of new people. I think we need to think differently about it. We need to think about how the the system has been designed with the right kinds of incentives to accommodate all these kinds of new actors. Right now, it's kind of this fun golden age of Cardano where a lot of the people involved were these early adopters and we're all thinking about these high philosophical ideals. I think it's very possible we're about to go through a new phase where a lot of people jump into Cardano who don't care about any of those ideals, you know, or maybe only very lightly, they're in it, they're in it to make some money. But I do believe that the right incentives have already built into Cardano. So I think we can rest easy on that front. We just have to remember, we're probably going to exceed whatever you think the Dunmar number for a cryptocurrency ecosystem is. And we need to be aware that the kinds of actors coming in might be very different from the current ones. But that's okay. I think we'll be just fine because the right kinds of incentives have already been built into the system. Talk to you tomorrow.